In the beginning of my walk with God over 50 years ago, Jesus appeared to me in a dream. And what he said was so profound, it has echoed in my soul ever since. And it has a lot to do with the revelation of Acts 15, 14 that says we are a people for his name. As I mentioned at the beginning of this podcast, over 50 years ago, I had a dream, a very profound dream, where Jesus came to me and he was weeping. I can't tell you what it felt like. It just gripped my soul. And he said a very simple statement, but it was not simple in meaning. He said, you know that I am the everlasting father but there are many others who don't. And then he disappeared. It rang in my soul for days. You know I am the everlasting father, but there are many others who don't. And I realize this world is teeming with billions of people that are oblivious to the fact that God visited the earth in the form of his son and that he came to reveal the way back to heaven, and it's our charge to represent him in this world. And that's why Acts 15, 14 declares that we are a people for his name. And we're going to unpack all of that on this episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity. First, let me talk about the dream a little bit more. Jesus said, you know I am the everlasting father. Well, where does that come from? Is there something in scripture that reveals that as truth? Absolutely. It's the prophecy of Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, where in advance, the prophet revealed the Messiah to come and said, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. Notice the child was born, but the son was given because the Son has existed eternally, eternally into the past, eternally into the future. So the Son was given, but the child was born. He had never come in the form of a child. So let me go back, Isaiah 9, 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the everlasting father and the prince of peace. I believe that there is a reason for the progression of those five names given to him. When you first meet him, when you first come into a salvation experience, he's wonderful. And you think your life is going to be heaven on earth from that point forward. But then you face trials and tribulations and heartaches and disappointments and rejections and persecutions. And you find out that not only is he wonderful, but he needs to be your counselor. He needs to teach you, to train you how to respond to the negatives of life, how to overcome the negatives of your life. And he counsels you with his wisdom on that uh, particular area and any other area you need his help on. Then once he solves these problems, once he provides solutions to you in areas that you need his assistance, then you realize all the more he's not just a teacher. He's not just a prophet. He is the mighty God. He is the mighty God in human form walking on the earth. And when you realize his deity, his divinity, when you realize he meant what he said, when he declared, he who has seen me has seen my father. He said, I and my father are one. Then he's lifted up a little higher even in your understanding in the revelation of his identity and you realize he is the everlasting father, the image of the invisible God. Hebrews chapter one, verse three says that he was the brightness of the father's glory and the express image of his person. 
the express image. That's from the Greek word character, which we get our word character from. And so to call Jesus the express image of the Father was a way of saying he was the character of the Father expressed in this world. How amazing is that? If you want to see the love of God, look at the life of Jesus. If you want to understand the wisdom of God, listen to the teaching of Jesus. If you want to embrace the knowledge of God, then embrace the parables that Jesus spoke when he was on the earth. If you want to see the joy of God or the peace of God, see them demonstrated in the life of Jesus because he was the express image of the Father's person. How amazing is that? He was God manifested in the flesh. We believe in the triune God, that the Godhead is made up of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and there's interpersonal relationship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and yet these three are one God. No wonder Paul said it is a great mystery. Well, let's go to Acts chapter 15, because this is where we find the title for God's people that is the object of our attention. On this podcast, it was also the thing we taught on last week, and it will be continued into the next program as well. But this was the first apostolic council or the first meeting of the apostles that is recorded in the book of Acts where they deal with certain church issues. And one of the main issues they had to deal with was the fact that so many Gentiles were being converted. And some of the Pharisees who were now Messianic believers felt that all these Gentiles had to be circumcised and had to keep the law. And I may deal with that in greater depth in another podcast. But anyway, they had a discussion on that issue because they felt it was absolutely essential that the Gentiles embrace all the Old Testament as well as coming into the revelation of the Messiah and function according to the Torah, the law. And listen to what happened. Well, first of all, Peter rose up and talked about how God had sent him to the household of Cornelius and how uh, that God had, and this is quoting from verse 9 of Acts 15, made no distinction, Peter said, between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. And so Jesus revealed himself to them, the power of the Holy Spirit entered them, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, began to speak in tongues, without adhering to certain aspects of the Torah, like circumcision. Their hearts were purified by faith. And so Peter said, now, therefore, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? But we believe that through the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they. Then all the multitude kept silent. They were really pondering this pondering how to balance out the old covenant and the new covenant and fuse them together harmoniously and yet intelligently. And after this long silence, then Paul, Barnabas and Paul got up and talked about the many miracles and revivals that were happening among the Gentiles. And so James, that was apparently the head of the church in Jerusalem, said, men and brethren, listen to me. And this is when a decision is being made. Simon, which was another name for Peter, has declared how God at the first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. There the title is that rests upon all the new covenant people of God. All those who have been born again, washed in the blood, are referred to as a people for his name. And then they went on to resolve the issue they were dealing with. But the main focus I want us to take is on that particular title, a people for his name. Five words that rest upon us. What does it mean to fulfill that call, to fill that role? Well, I believe, number one, it means we exist for the glory of his name. When people look at our lives and see the transformation that's taken place, 
then his name should get glory. We certainly should not get glory because any goodness in us is not because of our willpower or our theological prowess. It's not because of what we've done or what we understand or who we are. It's because his name, through faith in his name, has made us whole. Just like the man at the gate, beautiful. His name, through faith in his name, made that man whole physically. Well, it's made us whole mentally and emotionally as well. Number two, if we are a people for his name, we exist for the revelation of his name. It is our calling to let people know what the name of Jesus is all about and how powerful that name is. Well, just the revelation of his name in Hebrew, Yeshua, means salvation. So when you call on the name of Jesus, his very name embodies what he does. He brings salvation into your life. And the word salvation means deliverance. And it means deliverance from all the arch enemies of the human race, deliverance from sin, deliverance from satanic control and satanic agendas against us, deliverance from the lower nature, deliverance from the curse, deliverance from death, deliverance from the grave, deliverance from hell, deliverance from all the battles of life, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Just calling on the name Jesus embodies all the deliverance power that you will need to overcome in all of those areas. I will never forget one night, and this is almost this is almost too heavy for some people to believe, but I was there. I experienced it. I cannot deny it. I was going over Soco Mountain in western North Carolina, driving on my way to a revival. It was the middle of winter. It had snowed, pretty heavy snow, I guess three or four inches. And apparently the county on the west side of the mountain was better at clearing the snow off of the road than the county on the east side, and the counties changed at the peak of the mountain. Well, I'm coming up one side of the mountain, and we're on pretty good roads, so I'm moving at a good clip. And then I hit the top of the mountain and hit ice. The whole road is covered with ice. We started sliding broadside, to this rail and I surely would have flipped over the rail and my van would have rolled down the mountainside and probably would have been the end of my life. I did not have time for a very complicated or impressive prayer. I didn't have time to say, oh, thou most gracious heavenly father, by your mercies, preserve us from disaster. Or of course I'm saying that tongue in cheek. I don't necessarily pray with that kind of religious sound in my voice. All I had time for was to shout one name, Jesus. And I don't care what the skeptics say. I felt the hands of God grip my vehicle and I went around this 90 degree turn. Instead of, I had no control of the steering wheel. I could try and steer it, but it wouldn't help at all. However, I went right around that curve went down to the next 90 degree turn and went around that curve without even attempting to be involved moving the steering wheel. God just guided me around three curves and we got to the base of the mountain. It was a very heavy experience to say the least, but it happened at the mention of his name. I don't believe we're tapping into the power of his name. To be a people for his name involves, number one, we exist for the glory of his name. Number two, we exist for the revelation of his name. Number three, we exist for the impartation that's available through his name. Number four, we exist for the vindication of his name among all the mockers and the skeptics and the ridiculers and those that tear down respect for his name. We exist to uphold it. And number five, we exist for the proclamation of his name. We are a people for his name. Let me go back to the third commandment, the third of 10 commandments that were spoken from Mount Sinai. And I don't believe people really understand what God meant when he said, do not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Most people think that means using the name of the Lord as a curse word or using it irreverently. 
And certainly that's part of it, but I don't believe that's all of it. Notice the wording real carefully. Do not take the name of the Lord, your God, in vain. I liken that to the way my wife, Elizabeth, took my name. Prior to our marriage, her last name was Aldrich. But then after we got married, she took upon herself my name. She is a Elizabeth Shreve now. And she's nodding her head and smiling on the other side of this camera. And I'm having a hard time concentrating because she's sending me such sweetness right now. But when she took my name, she did not take it in vain because she's been an amazing wife, virtuous wife, faithful wife, devoted wife, loving wife. And I could, I could add so many adjectives to that. It would take me many more programs. And she just threw me a kiss. So I better continue with this. <laughs> but anyway, she did not take my name in vain. She took it and she respected the fact that from that point forward, we were man and wife, and we were to, to protect that holy union between us. Well, it's the same when we take upon ourselves his name. We are the bride of Christ, and we marry ourselves to the bridegroom. And if we were unfaithful compromisers involved in worldly things, and living hypocritical lives, we would take his name in vain because we would not be proclaiming his name, vindicating his name, imparting to others the power of his name, revealing the mystery of his name, or sharing with others the glory of what his name has done in our lives. All of that would be defiled and contaminated and polluted and non-functional. And we would not be a people for his name if we took his name in vain. I believe we need to profoundly attach ourselves to that revelation and live uprightly before him all the days of our lives, not just for our sake, but for his name's sake. Your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake and so that his name can be lifted up in this world. Now let's go to Proverbs 18.10. I mentioned this on the last podcast. The name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous run into it and they are safe. I want you to notice that a tower normally is made of many blocks laid one on top of the other and fused together with mortar in order to erect this edifice, which is usually a place of defense or a place of protection. A tower is a place of preservation, a place to store valuables, it is a place of defense. And the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And we are the valuables that are being preserved by this place of defense, which is the revelation of his name. How powerful is that? And so we need to understand that his name is a multifaceted name, just like there are many blocks laid one on top of the other in order to erect a tower so God has hundreds of names and titles fused together into one name. See, my name, if I were to use the word reverend, I never use it. Uh, I'm very reluctant to use it, except when I have to legalistically, because the only time you find the word reverend in the Bible is in reference to God. But for the sake of example, my name is Reverend Michael Richard Christopher Shreve. I was raised Catholic, confirmed as a Catholic, and I received a saint's name and I was supposed to pray to that saint the rest of my life, which I do not do. I do not believe in praying to the saints any longer. But anyway, I want you to see that my name, singular, is actually made up of five parts, plural. Reverend Michael Richard Christopher Shree. It makes up one name. And in like manner, God has hundreds of names and titles that are fused together into one name that is a place of defense and security and preservation for us. And we're going to start off with just two references, and then I'm going to continue with this on the next program. But let's go back to the fourth word in the Bible, at least in English, it's the fourth word. In the beginning, God. Now, how is that a revelation? Of course, we know he is God. 
But why would that be something profound for us to set our attention on? In the Hebrew, it's the word Elohim. And the singular is El. But Elohim is a plural word that's translated in the singular. Over 200 times Elohim is translated into the word God's, small letter G. But over 2,000 times it is translated into the word God capital G. So from the very start, from the fourth word in the Bible, in the English version, God is revealing the triune nature of the Godhead, that he is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, but these three are one God. It's a plural word translated singular. Isn't that powerful? So every time you say God, as you're quoting scripture from the Old Testament, you're revealing the plurality of the Godhead, the triune nature of the Godhead, which is the mystery of all mysteries. But it's not long before God reveals there's something to add to this. In Genesis chapter 2, verses 7 through 9, it talks about the creation of Adam, and it says, The Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Some translations say a living being. The Lord God. So now a name is added. It's not just God. It's not just Elohim, but it's the Lord God. And the word translated Lord there is the Tetragrammaton. It's the four-letter name for God in Hebrew. Transliterated into the English alphabet is Y-H-V-H or Y-H-W-H. In Hebrew, it's yad heh vav -He. And that's translated Lord. And so now God is personal in a form in the garden, shaping a human being out of the dust. That's God manifesting in the garden in a form, in an image. And didn't we talk about it in the beginning of this podcast, that Jesus is the express image of the invisible God? That was Jesus in the garden shaping the dust into his own image, though he was not known as Jesus. That would not happen for thousands of years, that revelation of that particular name. Still, he was Yahweh the Tetragrammaton, Y-H-W-H, the Lord God, Yahweh Elohim. I'm going to talk a lot more about that on the next episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity. But I want you to take home from this program, the takeaways from this program are the five ways you should function in this world if you're going to be a people for his name. You exist for the glory of his name, for the revelation of his name, for the impartation that is available through his name, for the vindication of his name in a world that desecrates his name. Islam speaks about the name of Jesus. Jesus is mentioned over 60 times in the Quran, but they reduce him to just a prophet. He's not the son of God. He's not divine in Islam. And so we need to vindicate his name uh, and we need to declare that he was more than a man, more than a teacher, more than a prophet. And then in the new age, of course, the new age reduces him to just a way shore, someone who achieved Christ consciousness, something we can all achieve. And we've got to vindicate his name and declare, no, Jesus was more than just a way shore. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one can come to me but by, no one can come to the Father but by me. And that's the way, the truth, and the life. Those are three more titles that belong to him, part of the tower that we run into and find safety. So we got a lot more ground to cover, and we're going to continue with this in the next episode of Discover Your Spiritual Identity.